Hello and welcome back to, well, yet another somber edition of the House of Hoosier podcast brought to you by the Field of 68 Podcast Network. It is late on Thursday night, January the 18th, less than 24 hours before the Hoosiers head up to Madison, Wisconsin to take on the Badgers. And we're here for not a Field of 68 after dark, that's a different brand, but a House of Hoosier after dark to recap the Purdue game and look ahead to Wisconsin. I'm Austin Platt alongside my co-host Ben Haller. As usual, special guest from the Indy Star, Zion Brown, a reporter and another the other um, co-sports director at WIOX Sports. We brought on William McDermott a few episodes ago. Zion, the bar is set very low for you, uh, I, I must say, after <laughs> after that one. Indiana's performance was bad. And then after the uh, Rutgers game, we talked to William and now here we are after Purdue. How you doing, Z-Man? I'm good. I'm good. And I, I'm glad to hear that um, me and William were having this this long car ride to Wisconsin on Friday. So I'll make sure to know that that the bar was apparently set low. So we can have something to talk about there. But yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. Indiana's play lately, the bar is kind of more or less set on the ground as Indiana has plenty of work to do after the really embarrassing loss to, to Purdue the other night at Assembly Hall on Tuesday night after Indiana came out on fire with a great win against Minnesota, giving themselves some momentum, and then completely laid an egg. They lost by 20-some-odd, 21 points, whatever it was, and the game was more or less kind of uh, wrapped up at halftime as Indiana was down 51-29 to 29 at that point. Uh, Zion, let's just talk about first things that you saw from that Purdue game. Uh, the, just the incredibly slow start and just the inability to guard Zach Eady. Yeah, those were the two main things that stood out to me. One is the Zach Eady guarding, just the way that every time Zach Eady caught the ball, he was within four feet of the basket. Now, that's not to say there were a few times where Khalil Ware was so long that even though Eady had a great positioning, he got up a great contestant and forced a miss. That being said, the man still scored 33 points, so he couldn't have done that well of a job. Every time he caught the ball, he was just so close to the rim. Indiana, whether it was Khalil Ware, Peyton Sparks, Malik Renu, they had to try everybody because of some foul trouble. It didn't matter who it was. Nobody could stop him from just getting that deep seal and deep positioning. And, I mean, it's a well-known. Once, once he gets that deep, it's over. You know, you're not you're not really going to stop him, at least not a lot. Obviously, like I said, Ware did it a few times in that game. And then on the other end, what stood out to me was the post play on the other end. Not anything that specifically happened with the post players, but whenever Malik Renew caught the ball, he likes to catch the ball kind of – he faces up before he posts up, if that makes sense. And when, when Malik Renew caught the ball, there would be a guard just staring right at him. Usually you see some shading, maybe a quick stunt or a dig. You would see Braden Smith or Lance Jones or somebody just staring into Malik Renew's soul, for better or less, because they knew that Indiana was not a threat to shoot the ball from outside. And those are the main things that stood out in the half-court play, and then Purdue just – got to the line time and time again and got the wide lead that they never gave back. Yeah, Zion, I know a lot of people disagree. I've had this conversation the last couple of days, and I think it's hard to say that the losses, at least the transition from what we saw last year to this year, says more about Purdue than it does about Indiana. But I think you can make an argument. I think Purdue this year just finally has guard play. And, and it's not only guard play. People always talked about it. India Purdue needs to pr improve their guard play. That's how they become a, a bona fide national title contender. It's the wings, too. I mean, Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer looked great. And that's what Purdue has this season. And it's the, the fact they had guys like that in the past, but the depth wasn't quite there. Fletcher Lawyer and, and Lance Jones aren't the only two guys that can score 17 points outside of Zach Eady on this Purdue team. That being said, my biggest concern for the Indiana team, I think, is just leadership. Everyone knows what's going on with Xavier Johnson right now or doesn't know what's going on with Xavier Johnson right now. And zero points in the last three games and a flagrant two and a flagrant one in the last three games. Um, you know, the video going viral of Zach Eady beating Khalil Ware to the ground when Khalil Ware was much closer to the ball. It's just a lot of that going on in Indiana right now that – it's culture is not quite the word I've used. I think the word is overused in a lot of ways, but I think the attitude of this Indiana team right now is just in the dumps. I have a word for it. I would say it's vibes more than anything. This team throughout, throughout Mike Woodson's three year tenure, they face adversity. They face hardship every single year. I've been around all three years. So it's often the vibes seem lower right now, as far as just the intermingling of the roster than it has in the previous two years. You know, uh, two years ago, this team was a bubble team. They had to win a couple of games in the Big Ten tournament to get in the NCAA tournament. But at no point during that season did I feel like, oh, these guys don't like each other or and I don't want to say the guys on the current team don't like each other, but they don't seem that close. They don't seem like, you know, outside of a few players, mainly some of the front court players, they don't seem like guys that are just like, you know, nailed by the hip no matter what they're doing on or off the court. Whereas it's felt that way in the previous Mike Woodson years. And 
like you said, the, the leadership and the lack of energy at, in spurts is just kind of concerning and, and really glaring when you watch this Indiana team. You know, not many times you get booed at halftime off your home floor, especially against Purdue, one of the worst losses at home against Purdue since I think the year was 1934. It goes a long, long way back, which just shows you how embarrassing that loss really was. But they could have, you know, come out in the second half and laid another egg and lost by 40 points and had people leave, you know, at the at the 12 minute mark. But no, that they showed some fight in the first few minutes. Silent. Let's talk about kind of the response at least Indiana had going into that, you know, that first little spurt in the second half. Indiana got off to a solid lead in the first few minutes and Baco looked good made some big shots and then Trey Gallo in the second half turned it on he made some good shots what I guess from that five minute stretch could you look at in that second half and say okay we can use this going forward because a lot of that film it probably has already been recycled when we're recording this yeah I, I would say the way that Indiana turned our stops into quick offense is the thing you may point to and say that can be used going forward. You think about the threes they had. Trey Galloway, I think at least one, maybe two of his threes were kind of semi-transition at least. Same with the, the three that Gabe Cups made in that game. The way that they made the second and third and even fourth efforts on defense in that span, and they were able to turn that into quicker baskets on the other end. That's what really stood out to me during that, you know, five or six-minute span where they made a push. They got it within nine at one point. And that that's why I think they were able to do that is because the way they – they were able to use those slaps. Purdue couldn't set up their defense. Purdue's a defense that when they're set, it's hard to beat. You've got a great defender like Lance Jones, or e even if Ethan Morton's in on the perimeter, then you've got a guy, obviously, you got Edie down low. It's hard to get by. Caleb first when he's in the game is a really strong defender. So when Purdue is set defensively, they're they're hard to score on. But when you can get those stops and they're and they're backpedaling, you know, it's not always transition, but when you have them backpedaling instead of just set up in their stance, it's a different game. It was another big part of that first half, I think, and it's a it's a mistake Mike Woodson even admitted. I just don't think he's figured out substitution patterns yet, or what's the, what what lineups he likes together. Some of that's on Indiana, some of that's on Woodson. I mean, you being around the media, you know, Mike Woodson hates getting those questions, and he won't answer about substitutions. He won't give explanations, and you know, coaches don't owe you know don't owe everything, every piece of information to the media. But I truly think part of that is Mike Woodson doesn't know himself what he wants or doesn't have a plan. Once again, that's some part of the team. But not putting Mackenzie Mbako and Khalil Ware in the game with two fouls when the lead or lead is getting out of hand. I mean, you go down by 20 to Purdue, that game's pretty much out of hand. I mean, they have the, the, the little spurt at the beginning of the second half. But I think after those two fouls got cut from like 12 to 21, and that's a range right there. You just can't let happen. And I know you don't want to, you obviously don't want to risk getting the third fouls for the those two valuable players. But with how well offensively Maka was playing at the start of the game, I just think that's a, a tough decision to make. As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 each and every week of the college basketball season. We have a special offer that will be available starting on Tuesday, January 9th, and running through Monday, February 12th, the morning after Super Bowl 58. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, in honor of the big game, you can use the bonus code FIELD158 and you'll get $158 in free bets on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not you win that first bet. Here's how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD158. Deposit at least $5 and place your first wager on any game. You'll receive $158 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure that you use that bonus code FIELD158 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly, which happens quite a bit. When you cross state borders, you just log into your existing account and fire away. You don't have to create separate accounts in each state. It's easy, it's simple, it's clean. And most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the heart of the college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odd boosts, and my favorite, a nice juicy parlay boost. So download the BetMGM app and sign up today. Field. One five eight. Yeah, but and that's what I wrote about after that game is, is the substitution patterns and more or less why McKenzie Mbako and Khalil Ware didn't come back into that game. You mentioned it. Mbako scored the first seven points of the game for Indiana, and then he got a questionable charge call. I, I can go all day about stupid, you know, block charge calls. He got a questionable charge call, and then on the other end, the very next play, 
he does what a freshman does. He was out of position on defense, not ready to help and just commits a dumb foul. And Trey Galloway talked about that after the game. He said, we were committing dumb fouls. I know a lot of Indiana fans don't want to hear that. They were mad the entire game. And some of the foul calls were bad. I, I, I agree with some of the complaints, but a lot of times Indiana were just committing fouls that weren't smart, that had nothing to really do with affecting the play, and that got them out of rhythm. But as far as Mbako and Khalil Ware sitting for that long, they should not have been on that bench for that long. They, I don't know if Indiana would have been close in the game had they been in, but I knew for a fact why they were sitting out for that whole time until the last three minutes of the first half. Indiana lost the game there. They were never going to be able to come back from that deficit they had gathered by sitting two of their best players on that night, the guy that was going to be their best scorer in Mbako. And they just gave the game away. Mike Woodson and his coaching staff were never able to recover, and they just waited way too long to put two of the main starters, the main pieces of this team back onto the court. You say two, and this brings up something that for me, yes, we could talk about substitutions, but at the beginning of the game, I don't remember the first time. I can't point to a time where Indiana doubled Zach Eady in the post as soon as the ball was there. It took them a while, it felt like, in my mind, to double him. And sure, Khalil Ware has the height, but he doesn't have the size. And Malik Renu, we know defensively at times, will just foul. We know Zach Eady will probably get more calls than other players will in this conference. But for me, I was like watching and I was like, Where's the double team? And at, at one point, you know, as you mentioned, Edie caught the ball so deep that there was no, even if you doubled, he could just score over both of them. So I felt like, I don't know if I'm crazy here, but why didn't Indiana double Edie right from the jump? I, I'm not sure exactly why they didn't do that. It's tough this year. It, it felt much like a much easier thing to do last year when Purdue didn't shoot the three that well. But this year, you have a lot of guys shooting the ball well. I know Braden Smith was 0 for 6 in this game, but you can't go into the game saying, oh, I know he's going to miss all six of his three-point attempts. You know, you, you just don't know that's going to happen beforehand. Even in the game on, on Tuesday, Fletcher Lawyer was 4 for 4. So the, those two kind of offset each other. You had one that was, you know, missed everything and one that made everything. So it's hard to figure out when to double ED and whatnot. But I really, I really think Mike Woodson and the coaching staff, they were preparing, they were hoping that – Khalil Ware could do more work before the catch than he did in this game. I think I think that's where that's where they lost those battles is before the catch. Like I said, he was getting the ball so deep. I, I wondered at one point if if they were going to front Zach Eady with with Khalil Ware and try to see if they could throw it over the top of Khalil Ware and, and Khalil Ware could use his hands in the passing lane. They never really tried that. So between you know sending an earlier double team or just doing your work before the ball is even thrown there. I think Indiana could have maybe done a better job and schemed up a better plan than what we saw in that game. Look at big picture now. I, the Purdue loss, obviously, you lose at home to the number two team in the country, is not a, usually not a huge uh, negative on your record. Not a ton of bad losses for Indiana right now, but the, the metrics are really bad. And there are a lot of time left, but they're in the, I think, exactly at 100 in the net right now, somewhere in the 90s, and Ken Palm. And a big reason why, I mean, margin of victory matters. And in quad one games, Indiana is 0-5 with an average margin of defeat of 17 and a half. They can't play close with, with uh, good teams right now. It's, yeah. it, in Usually, in a situation like this, in a normal year, Indiana would have plenty of more opportunities in quad one games to not only pick up some wins, but to just be competitive in some more. But there's only six left. It, it's, it's a down year for the Big Ten. The net doesn't love the Big Ten a whole lot. Are you worried right now about... And obviously, with the metrics that bad, it's so you're going to be somewhat worried. But do you think, you know, Indiana needs a, a win against Wisconsin or Illinois on the road, which is going to be tough as it is to to keep their tournament hopes alive? I, I think it would be tough for IU to lose both of these next two upcoming games: the Wisconsin game on Friday night, the, the Illinois game next Saturday, and to have a realistic shot to make the NCAA tournament. You mentioned it; they don't have a single quad one win, and we are on January nineteenth. I mean, that's that's not acceptable. That's not there's a lot of bubble teams that already have multiple quad one wins that are still going to be on the bubble. So for Indiana to be right there right now and not have a single one, I just don't think it'll be likely if this team loses to both Wisconsin and Illinois for them to say, OK, we could turn around and still make the tournament. There's not enough quality games left in the Big Ten schedule. It's completely fair. You talk about the big picture and what that the average you know margin of loss in those quad one games. 
if it wasn't for the Kansas game, those other four or whatever it is, or that's more like 25. So Indiana lost by like five to Kansas and all those other games were, were closer to 30, you know, the, to 25, 30 than they were to 10, 15. So Indiana kind of, you know, saved themselves there by keeping it close to Kansas. But that's yet again, a game Indiana should have won. Let's also talk big picture. I have to ask, I asked Durham about this and uh, Xavier Johnson, it's three straight games. Now the last three games, he's been pathetic. I mean, quite literally, he, he's just, I don't think he scored a single point. Hasn't found his rhythm. You know, the Rutgers game, he had quite literally a low moment in that game when he got ejected going, you know, beneath the belt. Uh, this game, you know, another, you know, flagrant foul, you know, pushing on Zach Eady, which didn't help. Where does Indiana go with him? We've sat here and we've said, you know, Indiana's a better team still with him. I think as a sixth year guy, he's got to play. Gabe Cups is a freshman, is still a true freshman, still learning. But where in the heck does Indiana go with Xavier Johnson? If they, you know, obviously they're going to keep him on the team. There's going to be no punishments or anything like that. But how the heck does Indiana put him into the into a rhythm and get him going? Because without X, Indiana, I don't think has any chance of even maybe finishing top half in the Big Ten at this rate. I'll be honest with you, Austin. I I think if Indiana doesn't win against Wisconsin or Illinois and they lose that home game on, on January 30th against Iowa, I think we could be heading toward a scenario where we basically, I don't say ever, but we basically stop seeing Xavier Johnson playing games. And that's not, and that's not because he's not good at all or anything, but because at that point you're looking at a team that would be four and four and six in big twelve in Big Ten play, excuse me. 12 and nine on the season and just on the way, way outskirts of making the NCAA tournament. And if you're Mike Woodson at that point, if you're the whole coaching staff, you're saying, okay, the future at point guard for us is Gabe Cups. Trey Galloway, if he wants to, he could come back next year for his fifth and final year of eligibility. Where at point guard at that ball handling position does, does Xavier Johnson fall in that? Xavier Johnson came back to Indiana. They came back to Bloomington to compete you know, near the top of the Big Ten and to make the tournament again. And and if if you're at a place for that's almost impossible to do, I don't know if he would stay as a consistent mainstay in the lineup, especially given just the way it's played out for him on the court this year. Wow. I think Indiana Barstool account just needs to post the sacred triangle again. Maybe that gets Xavier Johnson going <laughs> like some some anger under his fire. Yeah, I I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I I really do think it's such a big part of why um Indiana's struggling like this. It's one thing to see your leader struggle on the court, but off the court with some of the mistakes he's making. It's just so hard when you have you see somebody who's been in the game for six years and you're a freshman or you're a, a sophomore and you just transferred. It's just hard to see that and, and hard to find a leader on that team. Now, looking forward, we talked about those two games. You think they need at least one win to, to stay in the NCAA tournament. It starts with Friday. And the fact that Wisconsin just lost to Penn State does not make things any easier. No, it doesn't. That's a great point. Wisconsin is going to come into this game on Friday ticked off because they're looking at it like they, they have a real chance to win the Big Ten regular season, which I don't think many people thought even at the beginning of like December when, when Big Ten play started, people thought it was going to be a runaway Purdue victory. And then I know where Wisconsin starts 5-0 and and you don't expect to drop the game at Penn State. I know it's a, an away game, but Penn State, probably the worst team in the conference this year. You don't expect to drop that game. So they're going to be upset. They're going to be coming out with a fire. Not that IU won't. Obviously, IU just lost by 20 points. They should have some sort of pride in that. But the fact that Wisconsin is at home, we know the long, the almost 30-year streak now of Indiana not being able to win at the Kohl Center. This is a Wisconsin team that is going to come out motivated and really wanting to just not even mess around with this game against an inferior IU team. You mentioned this is a Wisconsin team that has probably overperformed uh, to this point. Sure, I don't think they've played the likes of Illinois or Purdue yet, which is kind of what we think to be the, the clear top three in the conference right now, and then everyone else can kind of be just shuffled in that tier two category, as Ben and I always like to do these tier lists for the Big Ten, and I think we might as well just stop because it's just making our, ourselves pull our hair not out. Even close. It's, no. this, it's just not fun. It, it's brutal. But uh, you look at this Wisconsin team, they're balanced. They have a, great, a good point guard and Chucky Hepburn, shooters, you know, Connor Asijan. They have the two bigs down low, Wall and Crowell. I don't think Brad Davidson's on the team anymore, but, you know, he, who knows how many years of eligibility. Wouldn't be surprised if he just stood it up and came back for this game. Where, Zion, could Indiana exploit this Wisconsin team? They're 11-point underdogs, uh, but, you know, how can Indiana – Put up a fight, I guess, is what we're just kind of trying to look for in these quad one games. But where can Indiana look and maybe 
give themselves, tell themselves they have a fighting shot against the Badgers and not the, and not in a house of Hoosier, but in a house of horrors that has been, uh, what is it? The, what, the Cole center or whatever that place is 1998. It's the last time they won. How can Indiana break that streak? It's going to be tough. I mean, you look at this Wisconsin team, the, the balance is what, is what strikes me the most. They have a lot of players that can just contribute at any night. Right now they've got six guys at above eight points apiece. And the sixth of those six guys is Chucky Hepburn, who we've seen be, you know, I think he was their second leading scorer last year. The seventh guy averaging just three points a game is Connor Asijan, who had a really good freshman season. So this team you can kind of hit you from anywhere. Um, the battle of the bigs is going to be the main thing here. I mean, you got Kroll and Wall going against Malik Renew and Khalil Air, and it'll be just about who who can play smarter basketball. Foul trouble, of course, is going to play a factor anytime you talk about four really good big men. Who can who can stay out of foul trouble, and then who can just stay composed and and be smart on their post plays and, and make the right plays from the post? I think that is going to be the most fascinating part of this game. If any Adams bigs can really punch the Wisconsin bigs in the mouth early on, then we might be looking at a game where IU can really compete and, and be in it for a whole forty minutes. It's an interesting matchup with uh, Crowell and Wall and then Renew and Khalil Ware because they're very different style bigs, too. But you have four really good bigs in the game tomorrow, which is going to make it a ton of fun to watch. And none of them are, are Zach Eady, so I think Indiana fans are going to be happy about that. It's, I think it's a winnable game for Indiana. Um, I know that the sentiment that you get a lot, especially in the Big Ten, where it's like Wisconsin's just going to be ticked off just coming off that loss. Sometimes those kind of games hurt your confidence. And Indiana just comes out on a hot night. Wisconsin stays cold. It's not the most unrealistic thing in the world. But I do think that they need one of the next two against Wisconsin, against Illinois. So after that, you have four quad one games. Usually you're in Big Ten play playing that many. You're going to need at least three to sneak into the tournament. And getting three of those next four is kind of tough. You go to Purdue. You go to Ohio State. What's going to Ohio State for basketball is like coming to Indiana for football. I mean, it's just not the – uh, a same kind of atmosphere as you get with the other sports. <laughs> Michigan State, who for some reason the net loves, comes to Indiana, and then Wisconsin will come to Indiana later in the year. That being said, so important to Indiana. Give me a score prediction for tomorrow or for tonight. Oh man, I think Indiana covers that eleven point spread that Austin mentioned, but I will go. I'm going to say it is a seventy three. 66 Wisconsin win. I just I don't see Indiana winning this game after the way Wisconsin just got upset at Penn State. I think another big thing in this one is AJ Store. Who Indiana puts on him because he's the small forward. And I just kind of mentioned the the excuse me, the McKenzie and Baco defensive struggles. You want to put your freshman on a on a more experienced sophomore guard who's six six and can can score himself, or do you want to see if Trey Galloway can kind of play up and you kind of mix around the lineups defensively? That'll be a big part of this game. At the end, I think Indiana probably would just can't score quite enough to keep up with this team. And I, I think the the Badgers get out of here with the win, getting back on track in the Big Ten. Uh, I'll, I'll, this game might remind me a little bit of the Rutgers away game last year. I think I think it's low scoring, um, and maybe there's just Wisconsin goes on a big run in the second half and just drowns Indiana out. And I think I don't know if Wisconsin even gets to the 70s. We know that you know in the past they'll score 43 points and somehow still win basketball games. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think this is kind of a a 68-59 uh, Wisconsin win where they really pull away late. But I think Indiana plays this one close for at least 30 minutes. And, you know, sometimes after the way last performance went, that's all you can ask for. But uh, we mentioned you need one of these two wins. So, Ben, we all said we all said Purdue in the last episode when we were on with the co-host of the old gold show. So if we all go Wisconsin here, either we're Sunday night football and they're completely wrong and Indiana wins and reverse psychology, or we're just going to do this again and Wisconsin's going to blow us out. Okay, I promise that before you said that, and both of you guys said Wisconsin, I was going to pick Indiana. You know, not only to be different, but I think once again, I, Indiana. You're not impressed also by the Wisconsin team, are you? You're not impressed by this Wisconsin team, are you? I. They're <laughs> defensively a really good team, but I think offensively they just go on so many lulls. I mean, when you play so slow as so as slow as they do, I. Th I think, you know, you, you go hold for a little bit of time and it's so hard to get back into games. I think Indiana can yeah. score a little more consistently than this Wisconsin team can. At least that's what I've seen in the last few games from Wisconsin and before that Purdue game for Indiana. It is going to be low scoring. We're not going to see a whole lot of possessions in this game. If you like seeing fast-paced offense, it's not for you. I do like 69-67 Indiana Hoosiers get their first win at Kohl Center since 1998.
Yeah, you look at this Wisconsin team, their strength is not is not making mistakes on offense, which is a great – that's their biggest strength, which is a great uh, quality to have with your team. But sometimes when you need a bucket, I can get, I can get what you're saying. The fact that what I mentioned about the kind of egalitarian approach where anybody can get you a bucket, that's a gift and a curse at times. I get where you're coming from there. Well, let's hope uh, that Indiana can turn things around. There is, you know, we're trying to stay optimistic here after the embarrassment to Purdue. There are no students on the uh, the Wisconsin campus yet. They don't start classes until next week, and maybe whoever whoever Wisconsin fans are still in attendance might still, you know, be Packers fans and still uh, rooting for that team. So, you know, maybe the, the stock is all in the Green Bay Packers for Sunday night and not in the Wisconsin Badgers tonight. Friday night, a big tip-off at the Kohl Center. Indiana really looks to change their season around. 8.30 Eastern tip-off. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Is it a Peacock? Are we Are we going to need a Peacock subscription again tonight for this game? No, this is an FS1 game, I believe. Yeah, that's right. One. That's right. Yeah, we don't we don't need the, we don't need a Peacock subscription again. This is a WAOX instead, though. Still, that's FS1. true. Uh, that I don't true. know. I, I heard the the guys broadcasting that one aren't very good. Hey, it'll be me and Zach Browning. So <laughs> if you enjoy good broadcasting, I think you'll like to tune in WAOX. <laughs> well, maybe if uh, Indiana is getting blown out, maybe then we might have to listen to you and change some things up. But that'll do it for the special House of Hoosier After Dark podcast alongside my co-host, Ben Howler. I'm Austin Platt. Special thanks, Zion. Thanks for coming on. Zion Brown thanks from the Indy Star. Go follow him on uh, on Twitter and whatnot. And I uh, keep up with his great work and all of his great articles he puts out about Indiana basketball. But tonight, Indiana looks to change their season around. And we will talk to you next week here on the House of Hoosier podcast.